we continue in our series as we look at the various churches of the book of the Revelation. Our series that we've been looking at from the church at Ephesus, First Aid for the First Love. The text has been in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, which we read momentarily. Jesus commanded the Ephesian church to return to her first love. And Jesus commands his church today in, its, in all of its congregations across this nation, across this world, to return to its first love. B.B. King, also known as Riley B. King, was born September the 16th, 1925, Burr Claire, Mississippi, located in LaFleur County, three miles west of Itabina and associated with Greenwood, Mississippi. He passed away on May the 14th, 2015, at the age of 89. And in his lifetime, he was a famous musician, and he excelled in numerous genres, of a, especially in the genre of electric blues, using electric amplification of instruments, such as the guitar and others. He was also proficient in rhythm and blues, which is a way to express experiences of pain and the quest for freedom and joy, triumph, failures, relationships, hopes, the rhythm of life, if you will. He was also versed in rock and roll, obviously, and soul and gospel music. He played guitar and he sang and he named his guitar Lucille. His music and his affection for it and his participation in it started, however, at church. But it went on to include other venues as well, including local radio. He was affiliated with numerous record labels, RPN, Crown, Kent, ABC, MCA Records, to name just a few. And he earned the nickname the King of Blues. He was one of three kings of guitar, the other two being Albert King and Freddie King, no relation to B.B. King. And at his zenith, he was performing 200 concerts a year and hundreds of shows, 342 in just the year 1956 alone, and his career spanned decades. His music was, an, was evidence of that was his first love, if you will. And he performed a memorable song written by Lou Brown and Roy, or Ray Henderson, Roy Henderson, I think, its lyrics and the manner in which King performed them are indeed soulful and mournful, and no, I will not perform them for you this morning. But the words go something like this. The thrill is gone. The thrill is gone away. The thrill is gone, baby. The thrill is gone away. Do you note a theme there? The thrill is gone. This course could describe... Um, could describe easily the church at Ephesus, whom Christ is personally addressing, not so much as the high judge bringing about an assessment and a condemnation, although he does bring a criticism, but rather as that friend who says, you know, I have bad news. Being a pastor, one of the things that I do not like about being a pastor is when I have to be the bearer of bad news. Jesus is sharing this with the Ephesian church and the message to the other congregations as well. Those, or at least two churches, will be commended. The others will have some commendation with then correction. And then the church at Laodicea is implored, get right and get right fast. But today we're looking at the first love. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 in the New King James translation says, Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. This was a church that had a fervent passion. They had been zealous to hold to a high view of Scripture. They sought and they taught sound doctrine. And they were unwearied, perhaps even relentless in the pursuit of that. And that's a good thing. Dr. John MacArthur, a Bible teacher out in California, says this. The Ephesian church exercised spiritual discernment. It knew how to evaluate men who claimed spiritual leadership. 
by their doctrine and by their behavior. For over 40 years since its founding, the church at Ephesus had remained faithful to the word. Members had endured difficulty, persecution with right motives. And yet somewhere, somehow, and in some way, something went wrong. They had forgotten, perhaps even forsaken, that fervent first love. And Jesus provided a remedy, this first aid for a first love, if you will. So we have looked over this series at Ephesus, how we looked at the context of Ephesus, we looked at the commending of Ephesus, and today we're looking at the confronting of the Ephesus church. Christ had accurately assessed their condition. This is not guesswork. This is not having some type of bone to pick with somebody. This is a clear and honest and earnest discernment of the spiritual health and the spiritual heart condition of that church. He cut to the chase and he made the point. In the God's Word translation, that same verse I just read reads this way, However, I have this against you. The love you had at first is gone. I believe we see the confronting of a loveless religion. Jesus is issuing essentially an indictment. Their relationship with him was devoid of the fervent first love that they had begun with. And one can be certain that their fervent first love under the umbrella of Christ, that fervent first love as it would have then involved and embraced other members of that congregation, actually a series of house churches uh, spread out across the Ephesus community, not a monolithic one single church, mind you, but you can imagine that their first love then for one another was probably on the wane as well. And then... How if your first love for Christ is missing, therefore your first love for one another is equally absent, then where is the first love that says we want to take the gospel to those outside the doors or outside the walls of the church meeting place in the first century or if we apply it to any and all churches in the 21st century outside the doors and the walls of the church house to seek people who are lost, to invite them to Christ, to engage in that gospel conversation. But if there is not love, if there is not that fervent first love for Christ and one another, there will not be that love for others. Therefore, their religion, although powerful, and doctrinally correct, was loveless, more routine perhaps than passion. Dr. William Barclay, another Bible teacher, has said, the first enthusiasm, thrill, had gone out of the religion of the Ephesian church. The fellowship, the brotherhood was gone. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 2 says, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord, this is what Yahweh says. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. In the language of the New Testament, the word left is represented by the term aphikas, and the scholars educate us to its meaning. It is to send away, to leave alone, the laying something or rather the, the laying of something to the side. If I were to take this note that I have and just simply lay it to the side and walk away. The Ephesian church had laid aside somehow, some way its first love. It may have happened by degrees. It may not have been an overnight situation. But little by little by little things occurred, perhaps due to carelessness or even, God forbid, by calculated choice or even the consequential result of seal, of zeal, excuse me, Z-E-A-L, not, not a seal as in you're stamping something, but zeal, an overzealousness that they wanted to hold high that doctrine and the word, which there is no shame in that. But zeal can sometimes, if not under, under the direction and the control of the Holy Spirit, can become something that is hurtful. The word for first love is the term protos. And the scholars also remind us that it means a foremost, a chief, a, a primary type of love. Christ, 
a love for Him by the church, by you, by me, by those who have gone before us and those who come after us is critical. Love for one another in Christ is crucial as an extension of that primary chief relationship. It will affect the quality and it will affect the quantity of ministry both within and without the church body extending to the community. And the community in 2020 and the 21st century desperately needs to see the love of Jesus Christ in action. A fervent first love and a frequent first love and a faithful first love for Christ and for one another so that when we say to them, we love Jesus and we love each other and we will love you, there is credibility, not because we have conjured something up, but rather because there is truth in the actions as well as in the words. The Bible says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced, that is, Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, again in the New King James. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. Ephesians 5, 12 says, well, actually, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, excuse me. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk, you could in translate that live in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. The word love arises from a term agapein which we can trace back to its roots agapeo that, that selfless love that, that gracious love that love that is sacrificial, a goodwill, a benevolence to prefer that which God prefers and the way which God prefers. In the context of this chapter and in of this verse, it is a reference to the love of Christians towards other Christians under the umbrella of the love of Jesus Christ, a love that is enjoined and prompted by their religion, that the, a, a holy affection for one another. A possible conclusion that you can draw from this is that the pursuit of doctrine and the testing of people who claimed or desired spiritual leadership could have resulted in a spirit of intolerance between the brothers and sisters or the producing of a rigid legality that choked out or pushed down love. People lost their motivation. People lost their enthusiasm, that sense of fellowship. Now, I'm all for sound doctrine. Do not misunderstand. The Word of God must be uh, preached, and the Word of God must be lived correctly and carefully, not just willy-nilly. I'm not suggesting that. I do not believe in frou-frou preaching by no means. But whatever we do, and however we do it, and, and the way in which we say it, needs to be guided by the love of Jesus Christ that comes from within flowing outward, something that we cannot fake, but we are indwelled by His Spirit. Barclay also says, it may be that orthodoxy had been achieved, but at the price of fellowship, and when that happens, orthodoxy costs too much. All the orthodoxy in the world will never take the place of love. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we throw orthodoxy out. I'm saying that love should surround and encapsulate and infuse 
all that we are. Not a love that says, hey, I love you if, or I love you but, but a love that says because Jesus is our first love, because he first loved us and has made it possible by grace through faith in him to be able to love him, then by the grace of God, I will love you and we will love others we do so and we will follow the word of God obediently, carefully, rigid in a sense. We will not deviate to the left or to the right and we do so in that Christ-like love. Even when Paul said, speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. A fervent first love for Jesus will and should manifest itself as a fervent love for others. If not, it is shallow, superficial, and hypocritical. And if that's the case, what's the point? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. One another. John 13, verses 34 through 35. Dr. Kendall Easley, a Bible expositor, has said it this way. In rooting out error and expelling false teachers, they had grown suspicious of one another. Heresy hunting had become harsh. It may have become a form of spiritual and religious head hunting, witch hunting, if you will, and to use modern parlance, an ice cold theology and a possible legalism had settled in like a form of rigor mortis. Apollos was an amazing preacher, a Jew born in Alexandria, perhaps Alexandria, Egypt. He was eloquent, educated, mighty in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and had a bold, fervent spirit. He taught with accuracy the things of Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. The Bible says in Acts 18, 26, So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He went on to become a more effectual evangelist and apologist. An apologist is not somebody, oh, I'm sorry, that's not apology. Apology is, here's what I believe, and let, you, let me tell you why and how I believe that based on the Word of God. And he demonstrated from, G, from Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. But note in there that, that this husband and wife team, they were discerning and they, they realized, whoa, wait a minute, Apollos is not quite giving the whole story as he's preaching and rather than jump up and say, excuse me, you're wrong, or excuse me, yeah, you're pretty much, you're 90% right, but there's 10% of your sermon is out in left field. Uh, they handled it a different way. They went to him privately, gently exposing error, providing corrective teaching in a way that would be beneficial. They spoke the truth, but they spoke the truth in love and in an attitude of, of sacrificial, Christ-like love rather than a harsh confrontation. And in so doing, they helped him to come to a richer and fuller understanding and acceptance of Christ, enriching his spiritual life, and thus enabling, or rather at least uh, contributing to the expansion of his ministry. He may actually be the human author of the book of the Hebrews, although there is dispute upon that. You say, well, that's nice. But how does any of this relate to October 2000? Do people see our love for Jesus by the way that we love one another? And do we love one another like Jesus today? Correct doctrine is crucial, essential. Flawed doctrine or a false doctrine must always be exposed and confronted in order to be corrected. No doubt about that. But the attitude which we use in the approach is also crucial. In love, are we sensitive to the needs of one another as well as others, especially outside the walls of the church? Are we sensitive not only to needs, but do we speak the truth? And will we speak the truth with one another and with others in that same spirit of Christ-like love? To be able, when I used to teach Bible at Benton Academy. I'd come in and I had, would have graded the papers the night before. Some of them, well, all I could say is they tried. Give them A for effort. 
That's about all they, I could do. I didn't come in and say, oh, I got your papers today. We're going to throw down. I'm going to let you know what you did wrong. You did not do good, and I'm going to let you know about No, I didn't do that. I told them, look, we'll get it next time. Let it be a learning situation. Or as I had a friend tell me not too long ago, this is an opportunity. Here's where you were wrong. I circled the correct answers. Learn it. Do better next time. Always encouraging. I had one student years ago who basically was just going to give up. I'll just, I'll just take it. I'll just give, go ahead and give me an F. I'll just, whatever. I'm like, no, I will not let you do that. I said, you're smart, you're capable, and I said, I believe in you. I said, so I will not let you give up on yourself. She passed by the grace of God. She passed. Oh, extra credit helps too. But her mother, <laughs> her mother came to me and she said, I appreciate what you told my daughter. It wasn't so much the material, although Bible is important. I'm not trying to downplay that. But rather the spirit in which I communicated. She was a person of value. Because sometimes in class, others would look at her and treat her as if she was not that smart. She was actually very brilliant. Speaking the truth in love is a way to communicate the gospel, not just with one another. It, it needs to be among us, but so that it's such, and I, I use this term loosely, is such a second nature with us so that when we are out and about that we are characterized by compassion and kindness and love so that people will say, you know, I want, I want, what, they're, I want what they have. I want to take what they're offering. A disagreement or difference of opinion or interpretation is, is room for the debate. And yeah, room for cor uh, course correction, but it's not always a cause for disfellowship or disunity. It's too easy to lay aside the first and fervent love for Christ and for one another and to take up the lure of a loveless legalism, a cold, rigid theology, and wage war against all nonconformity. Christ desires our unity and our harmony flow from being in union with Him in that love that He imparts to us. Dr. Ronnie Floyd, in a recent article, addressed, and I quote different parts, divisiveness and ongoing strife within our Southern Baptist family breeds turmoil, confusion, hostility, a loss of cooperative work and Great Commission effort, a loss of sorely needed spiritual leadership. Added to this what he calls angry, cruel, and ungodly carnal statements by Christians and even some Christian leaders via social media. Be careful what you post. Oh, so be careful what you post. It creates suspicion and greater fear rather than faith and hope. You could say that that might have been a description perhaps of the various local house churches making up the church at Ephesus. When all you hear is the negative, even when it may be necessary, one can lose that fervency, that enthusiasm, that motivation. It is important to stay, to stay motivated in that love of Jesus Christ so that it manifests as that love to one another that says, I love you, period. Not if or but or some other qualifier. Ephesus, then and the church of the 21st century had unexpected and unprecedented challenges. And if ever they needed to have that love, that fervent love for Christ and one another, and if it's true for them, it is true for each of us today. Let us be redemptive and nurturing of spiritual intimacy with our, our fellow believers, with our family, with our co-workers, our acquaintances, our, our fellow students, those that we are involved with on a daily basis so that orthodoxy does not quench love and that conformity does not masquerade as unity. But Christ, I believe, was confronting not only a loveless religion but a loveless routine. The, the Ephesian church may have become trapped in the rut of routine that sapped vitality right out of their first love. You just get into the routine, just over and over and over. Same thing, same way, same time, same channel, just over and over and over again. Now, there may not be anything wrong with routine if it is healthy, and if it is holy, it provides stability, but it can so easily become a rut 
which as one old preacher said, a rut is a grave with the ends knocked out. Routine can be repetitive behavior morphing into an instinctual habit, and that can cause problems. The rut of routine, meaning that they were functioning, they were existing, but that passion was not there. That they were engaged or embroiled in heresy hunting, but they got into a fixed pattern that they never could look at maybe the redemptive side. It's one thing to say, yeah, we got a problem then let's fix the problem. Where devotion may become devoid of meaning and leaves cold and hardness to one another, that is a chilling effect. In the business office, I worked in accounts receivable from 1999 until I went to accounts payable. And part of my job was to enter checks into the computer and also run them through the machine through some type of encoding device. Once you learn how to do it, you do it correctly, it becomes routine. You can become proficient in your efficiency. And it is equally possible to become complacent and careless. Little choices here and there, little, little things add up over time, no pun intended. And once I was entering and encoding and the task until keying in the names of the people, writing the checks, I had about 25 or 30 checks and I key them in the computer, then run them through the encoder or whatever you want to call it. And I kept noticing that the last names ended in ladle, L-A-D-L. Being New Orleans, it didn't strike me as odd. In fact, the seminary had long been blessed and influenced by the Lovell family for decades, having two seminary presidents, several buildings named after different members of the family, even the undergraduate side of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary is known as Level College. So logic told me, well, it must be a similar family legacy. You know, Boudreaux, you, know, you, you, you get the idea, all these different names, you hear them all the time. But it didn't gel with me. After about the 30th check, I'm like, man, that is a huge family. I asked the business manager, and I said, ma'am, I said, who is the Ladle family? She looked at me like I was crazy. With curiosity, who, what, when, where, why are you talking about, Charles? She came over to see what I was getting at, and to her amusement, my chagrin, the laughter, good natured of my peers, she explained calmly, carefully, and I believe in a very loving manner. We all had a good laugh about it. Ladle stood for Louisiana driver's license. It happens. Routine can become a rut. Complacency. I believe that one of the problems, in, in addition to their heresy hunting, was that maybe they got into that such a routine that little choices here and there began to become that rut that began to quench the love, the fellowship that they had one for another and for Christ. Christ wants you in a vital, dynamic love relationship with Him today, not a rut of routine. Do we routinely examine what we say, think, what we do, what we believe as Christians to see if we are in that correct doctrine and practice? Because if we're not, we need to get in the right, in the right path. Do we do so with an eye and an ear for spiritual vitality that can relieve us from any such rut of routine. But do we do so in love? Do we routinely check to make sure we are on message doing kingdom work from the width and the depth of a love relationship with Christ and with one another so that we don't become embroiled in a loveless routine? You know, 30 checks in, ladle family should include me in that, hey, we have a problem. First love manifested toward others can propel us to check it out, what's coming down the pike, because we have our fellow brothers and sisters' best interest at heart to stand on the sideline, to cheer them onward and to cheer them upward in their own race, to help them stay in their lane spiritually. A routine that is legalistic, a routine that is cold, forcing people to conform or whatever the case may be in that regard is not going to be spiritually healthy. I would say it this way. Let your zeal be real 
and let your zeal be real with the love of Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let us love Jesus Christ supremely. And let us love one another selflessly so that we may love others outside the walls of this church sacrificially. To see the Holy Spirit then use a word of witness from us that we may be able to engage in gospel conversation with any, with all, with young and old, male and female, makes no difference. They're all precious in His sight. And that as we engage, we're not just giving them knowledge. We're not just giving them information. We're not just giving them instruction. But that we're giving them an invitation to life. But that invitation is offered in a spirit of genuine love. And therefore, we come to this invitation. We come to the invitation because this morning it is important that in this moment that you have an opportunity to respond to Jesus Christ. That, uh, that invitation may be that for those hearing, whether it's online or on site, may be for the very first time that you may look and say, you know, I've had the religion and I've had it down pat, but I've never had a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Let your prayer, let your, your cry to Jesus be, oh Lord Jesus, save me, I am a sinner. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Nail it down today. I urge you to come to the altar. It makes no difference what people think of you or not. I would rather be thought of as a fool by the rest of the world but have the approval of God than to have the approval of, of humanity. Oh, he's such a good guy. And God say, I never knew you. Depart from me. It may be that other decisions need to be made. I do not know where you are in your love relationship with the Lord or in your love relationship as, as Christians with one another, but if the Lord should call you uh, to act upon any or all of that, then the altar is open and I invite you to come and to do business with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we close this invitation, well, I'm sorry, as we close this message and open this invitation, one of the things that I received in the mail that I opened this morning is that our church, we received a certificate of love or a certificate of appreciation, either way you want to define that. Five baptisms in 2019. No, I do not take credit for any of that. It is something that this church had a part in and the various peoples who have played a role in, in sharing the gospel, that you loved Jesus enough to be faithful you love one another in obedience to the command of Jesus so that you would go forth and some way, somehow engage with others, showing them that you love them in the name of Jesus. And God, in 2019, gave five. What an amazing thing. We celebrate that. 2019 is behind us. And I believe that God wants to do a work in our day, especially in 2020. And our prayer is to be, O oh Lord, let this time, especially this time that we're going through, let it be a catalyst for revival. Call us to your word, your worship, and your work. The invitation is open, and as we stand to sing our hymn of invitation, I invite you to come. I invite you to come to Jesus Christ. I invite you to renew that first love.